And um, he's at the stage where he's going to be moving from the center of his ministry being in the rural north of Israel uh, to the, the city of Jerusalem. But there was lots of stuff that he wanted to teach people when he was on the way. So we're going to journey on the road with Jesus and see what he has to say to each and every one of us. Okay? So, let's read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, please. Luke 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there didn't welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. May the Lord bless his word to us. So Lord, as we come before you tonight, we, we come with the recognition that your word is different from any other word. It's living, it's powerful, it's active, and it's very sharp. And Lord, no matter our situation tonight, we pray that your Spirit would come and take your living Word and make it alive to us this evening. That it might be just as if you are speaking to us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So as I've mentioned again uh, already, uh, Jesus' ministry, which was only for three years, is entering a new phase. And he's going to Jerusalem for the last time, which is going to end with him being crucified. Um, he's going to be leaving, the way he describes it, he's going to be leaving in a little while. And he'd already told his disciples about his death and resurrection twice. And he's just about to appoint and send out a new wave of messengers. Because by this time, his fame had spread. He'd been centered in the, the Galilee, northern part of Israel. Started very quietly. But when he started to do the things that only Jesus could do, feed thousands, calm storms, heal the sick, yeah, and so much more, people got to hear about it. And they came out of these rural villages in crowds to be with Jesus, to hear what he had to say. And uh, a very important part of his ministry is called the Sermon on the Mount, if you've never read the Sermon on the Mount, then I, I, I recommend that you read it from Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through to 7. 
because it's an amazing sermon when Jesus talks about his kingdom and what it is to live in his kingdom. And his values are so different to the world's values. As you've heard me often say, uh, he, 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 his kingdom is a right way up kingdom in an upside down world. And he was teaching people how to live in his kingdom. And that was in the first half of his ministry when he was up in the Galilee area. And now, now he's so popular and people are following him everywhere. And, and now he's going to set Jerusalem on fire. Not literally. But he is going to set it on fire. And he's beginning to prepare the way for the time when he is not going to be around anymore. And he's going to appoint many more disciples who are going to follow him, be trained by him. And this section is all about the training of the new wave of uh, 72 are about to be sent out in chapter 10, but it's not just restricted to 72. He's going to train them about what it means to follow him. And uh, I think it's very important and it's very relevant to every single person who's here tonight, including myself. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And for some of us who have been on the road following Jesus for many years, you know, it almost becomes second nature. But maybe it's time to reset and get back to basics and to follow Jesus and listen again to what he is saying. The first thing is this I want to bring to you, that discipleship is costly. When we think about cost, we usually think about money. But the cost of following Jesus is much more than that. It's costly in terms of our time. It's costly in terms of our gifts. Now, I'm not thinking about money gifts here. I'm thinking about the giftedness that he gives to those that follow him. There is the natural gifts, of course, but there is also the supernatural gifts. And these need to be used to advance God's kingdom. There's our ambitions. There's our money. In fact, when Jesus talks about following him, the cost is actually everything. Absolutely everything. And you see, Jesus didn't say to his friends, go into the world and make believers in every nation. He says, go into the world and make disciples. You know, this is a, a, a life-changing and a lifelong adventure that he calls us to go on. Not just a moment when we might acknowledge that we might believe him, who he is, that he is the Son of God who came into the world. That is who he is. But he doesn't call us just to acknowledge that, no. He actually uh, it calls us to, to believe in him to believe, ultimately, when we know the full story, that as the Son of God, He died on the cross for us. He bore the judgment for our sin on the cross that when we believe in Him, we might be set free from the, the guilt and the judgment that we deserve. Completely free. And that He might come into our lives and by His Holy Spirit, He might begin to change us and begin to produce in our lives the kind of stuff that he talks about in his sermons. You know, this is real rubber-hitting-the-road stuff. Yeah? And so he's talking here about what it means to be a follower of him. And it's costly. It costs Jesus everything. It costs him his life. And so he says, go and make disciples. That's disciplined followers, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so in our passage that we read tonight, we are discovering something about the cost of discipleship. Have you thought about what it costs to follow Jesus? Well, if you haven't, then I want to encourage you to think about it tonight. Yeah. 
whether we're young or whether we're old. Yeah. The next thing that I want to mention is this from the passages, and it's in verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now remember this. Jesus knew exactly what was in front of him. He knew what was going to be happening to him when he went to Jerusalem. His rejection, his trial, his torture, his suffering, his death, death on a cross, reckoned to be the, the most awful death that any person can die. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him. And uh, so he didn't run away from it. He went resolutely to go to Jerusalem. And uh, as followers of Jesus, one thing that we need to be is resolute. Absolutely resolute. Determined. Because it's not easy to be a follower of Jesus. It certainly wasn't easy for Jesus when he was here. And, and you know, he, he, he doesn't... Uh, you know, tell us that it's going to be easy. You know, he doesn't cover up what it's going to be like. He makes it abundantly clear if we're going to follow him, there's going to be times of trial and difficulty and opposition. Have any of you felt that? Yeah, it does happen. And we see it here as Jesus goes into a Samaritan village and uh, he sends some of his followers in front of him to prepare the way for him. Uh, now, Jesus loved Samaritans. <laughs> he loved them because he loves everybody. But he didn't receive a warm welcome when he went into the Samaritan village. You see, the Samaritans didn't like the Jews and the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. It was actually a bit more than didn't like each other. They hated each other with a passion. And so Jews who were moving from the Galilee region down to Judea and Jerusalem often would go down and cross the River Jordan and then come back up through Jericho to go to Jerusalem because they didn't want to go through Samaritan territory. Oh. <laughs> That's the passage. <laughs> Can you not get it to go off, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> David, go and, go and help Steve. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Resolute, yeah. Yeah. When Jesus went into their village, they didn't want him to stay there when they discovered who he was and when they heard that he was actually not going to see them, he was going to go to Jerusalem. And that animosity came out. So he moved on. And uh, racial hatred is something that's not new, <laughs> isn't it? But you won't ever see Jesus marked by racial hatred. He loved the Samaritans. You remember in John's Gospel, chapter 4, he went to Samaria and he went there to see one woman. One woman who was rejected in her community because of her lifestyle. But Jesus wanted to speak to her and meet her and chat to her. And remember, the Jesus who knows our hearts knew her heart. And he unveiled her whole life. And, and then he unveiled who he was. Remember this? Jesus said, I can give you living water. And here was Jesus at a well, asking for her, her to, to put her bucket down and bring up water so that he could have a drink. And then he says to her, if you'd only known, I can give you living water. If you really want to be satisfied, 
If you want the thirst in your heart and in your life to be quenched, we need to come to the living water and drink of him. But they didn't want him. And so sadly they moved on. So he's resolute in going towards Jerusalem. It's the word that it's the it's the root of what we say when we're making New Year resolutions, right? Any of you make New Year resolutions? No, no. I reckon you don't make them because you know in your heart you can't keep them. That's right. <laughs> because you need to be resolute to keep a resolution, don't you? Yeah. The idea of the, this word is to have a steely determination. Right? And so Jesus had this steely determination that he was going to go to Jerusalem and nothing was going to stop him. And uh, that's particularly poignant when we think of how much he knew of what was going to happen to him. So we need to be resolute to be disciples of Jesus, to keep on keeping on keeping on right to the very end. Many years ago, uh, there used to be an elder, elderly man, and, and V will, will know who I'm talking about right away, in our church, and I'll tell you his name because I don't think it'll make any difference. Some of you might remember. I think two of you might remember. His name was called Jim Stewart, and he lived in Gordon. He was a bachelor. And the very first time that uh, V and I and the kids came to the church, Jim Stewart was there. And uh, after the service, we went home and we thought, oh, I'm not sure about this church. <laughs> because Jim Stewart, he, he was a tall man. He was quite el elderly by this time. But he was a bit scary. Is that right? He was scary to look at, you know. And he had one eye that went a different direction to the other eye. And um, we only discovered later Jim Stewart's story. When he was just a baby, uh, he contracted meningitis. Uh, it didn't affect him physically the way it affected Este, But it was meningitis in his brain. And so he grew up not with the, having the ability to read or to write. I, I think Jim probably got a lot of um, cheek as he grew up, being the boy in the school that was different, being the boy in the, in the village that was different. Uh, but he grew up and he worked. He worked as a scaffy. You know what a scaffy is? collecting the bins in the area. That was the job he did. And he did it well. And then one day, he heard about Jesus. And in all of his simplicity, he put his trust in Jesus. I want to tell you, his life was changed. From that moment on, Jim's life was changed and he began to read the Bible. That was the way that he learned to read. And then he began to write. And uh, I well remember that almost every week in the service, in the Sunday morning, he would quote verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, except he didn't read it in Luke's Gospel. He read it from the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 50, where it says in verse 7, speaking of the Lord's servant, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? 
let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me, who will condemn me. Prophetically speaking, about things that happened 600 years later, things that we're talking about tonight. It's talking about God's servant going to the place where he's going to suffer. And old Jim used to pray in the mornings and, 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 and he'd be worshipping and he would say, Jesus set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem. Do you know what a flint is like? It's really sharp. It's really hard. Yeah. It, it's like a slate. Yeah. It, it's unmovable. You can't dent it. It's not easily broken. And that's really the idea of what Jesus was doing as he was going to Jerusalem. Try and imagine what it was like for him. How would you feel if you knew that in a few days' time you, you were going to be arrested? You're going to be put in trial. You're going to be falsely accused. Then you're going to be beaten and whipped so that the, the ribs can be seen. And you're covered in blood. And you've got a crown of thorns in your head. And you're dragged up a hill and then you're nailed to a cross and you're put in the ground and you're hanging there naked. Because that's what happened to the Son of God. That's how much he has loved me and how much he has loved you. And yet he went resolutely. Yeah. He went resolutely. That's what being resolute is. Standing and walking into the ferocious gale of adversity to reach our destination. Believe me, disciples need, if we're going to get real with God, we need to be resolute. Resolute. Final word about old Jim. I got really to respect him. And uh, in his last days, um, he had very poor circulation. He had tremendous pain in his feet. Um, his feet started to go black. But you know this? Every week he wanted me to come, collect him in the car, so that he could be with the Lord's people and worship the Lord. That's resolute. The most important thing in his life was to worship God and be with God's people every single week. He would be at the prayer meeting every single week. Every opportunity he could to be with the Lord's people, he was there. It was resolute. I thought, wow, what an example for me. What an example for you. And that's what discipleship means. It's to be resolute. Next thing is that disciples must learn to handle objections with grace. You'll see what happens after Jesus is rejected by the Samaritans. They get on their way again. And then the sons of Boanerges. You know who they are? James and John. What does the sons of Boanerges mean? The sons of thunder. Yeah. And so they say to Jesus, come on Jesus, bring down fire and destroy them. Yeah. Wipe them out. <laughs> Do you think he could have done that? by the way. I think he could. Yeah, quite easily could have done that. But no, Jesus doesn't do that. He rebukes them for saying such a thing. E effectively, Jesus is saying, leave the judgment to God. Yeah. There's going to be things that will happen to you that you don't like, but revenge is not the way forward. <laughs> leave that to God. So we need to learn to handle objections with grace. The next thing is the characteristics of effective discipleship. 
And uh, Jesus gives us three examples of the cost of following him. I'm sure you spotted them as we were reading tonight. I've got to say that these are some of the most challenging, toughest words that I find in the Bible. Uh, I don't know how you find them. But I find them so, so challenging. Because Jesus gives these three examples in verses 57 to 58. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Eh? We've all met, met people like that, you know. I'll do whatever you tell, you tell me to do. I, I'll just be with you. I'll be there by your side every moment of the day and night. And you turn around and they're nowhere to be seen. <laughs> Honestly, it happens. Yeah. And uh, I think what Jesus is really highlighting here, and by the way, he replies to the guy, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The wonder of it all is that one who created the universe, the one to whom everything belongs and everybody belongs because you were made by him. He came into this world not as a king, but as a poor carpenter's son. And, and he literally didn't own a house. He didn't have anywhere to lay his head. He often didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. So the first lesson is this. When we become a disciple, it's about faith. 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 You know, in the church, I think we can easily lose that principle. And we can start to think from a worldly perspective, you know, if we're going to do something, how are we going to pay for it? How will we raise money for it? You know, and you can go on. But Jesus didn't think that way. He lived his life out of faith. And if he's calling us to do something, he will resource it. We need to learn how to be faithful. The first step of faith is when we come as sinners, lost from God, um, on a journey in a, a life that leads to death, the first step of faith is to come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I, I, I just don't want a life like this. I hear what you say. You died on the cross for me. I come and I bring my sin and I lay it at the foot of the cross. And I trust you, Jesus, to be my Savior. I invite you into my life, to be the Lord of my life. I want to be your disciple. That's the first step of faith. But it's not the only one, is it? Disciple following Jesus is about the next step, the next step, and the next step. I could probably keep you going for a, a week <laughs> telling us about faith steps. Yeah, the, the reality of that. But faith as an essential component of being a follower of Jesus. We don't look at things from the world's perspectives or the world's standards or the world's resources. Yes, we may use the world's resources because God will, will, will help us to do that. But we need to learn to live by faith. Then the second thing is this. Jesus says to another man in verse 59, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow. What do you make of that? Do you think that's unreasonable? Well, a superficial reading of it, we might well say it was an unreasonable demand that Jesus was placing on this man. Until you begin to understand the Jewish culture. Because what Jesus is, telling about, uh, is teaching about here is priorities. What are our priorities? And Jesus says, you know, if we're going to follow him, 
you know, he's to be the first priority. In Jewish culture, you see, when, when somebody died, yeah, you, you, you placed them in a casket with dry lime. Uh, and uh, round about a year later, I hope you don't mind the gory details, but round about the year, a year later, the action of the dry lime would mean that only the skeleton was left. And the, the, the skeleton would be taken up and, and put into an ossuary, a place where the, the bones were kept permanently. And, and, and that was the, the, the ultimate burial of the person. And uh, what Jesus was really saying, you know, there's no time to hang around and wait a year to follow me. If you're going to follow me, follow me now. I'm calling you to, be, to make me number one in your life. How many of us know the verse, seek first the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and all else will be added to you. Yeah. It's a huge principle. It's a true principle to seek first the kingdom of God. He's more important than anything else in our lives if we follow him. Yeah? After all, he is God. And he does not want the worst for us. He wants the very best for us. And he will give us the best, particularly when we follow him. Yeah? So that's the second thing. The first thing is faith, faith, faith. The next thing is priorities. And uh, the third thing is unwavering commitment. Verse 61. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Again, is it an unreasonable request? I, I don't think so if there was a, a, a genuine desire in the person's heart to then follow Jesus. But I've learned over the years to recognize excuses when I see them. <laughs> yeah. Um, you often find that people just won't tell you the truth. And uh, Jesus is really saying here, if you're going to follow me, it's going to demand commitment. Today, back to the first day when you made your commitment and confessed Jesus as Lord, commitment that day, commitment the next day, commitment to the next week, commitment in the next month, the next year, year after year after year after year. It's a lifelong commitment, this journey of following Jesus, isn't it? It's so tough to hear, isn't it? It's so hard to hear. All I can tell you is that he wants the best for us. And he'll take us in an adventure that we will never, ever regret. Yeah. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's a song that many of you know. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Yeah. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Do you remember Lot's wife? Yeah. Lot's wife, Lot and his wife were rescued before Sodom and Gomorrah, before the, 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 the fire rained down in these towns because of, of the, the evil that prevailed there. And the angel came in and rescued Lot and his wife and his family. And they were rescued. And then for one person, Lot's wife, she looked back. They'd been told, don't look back. She looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt. Why did she look back? 
Well, she, she wasn't obedient to the command of the angel for a start, but her heart was there. Her heart was there. And she paid the price. Do you recall in, uh, as, the, as the Israelites were traveling through the wilderness from Egypt to Canaan, God fed them. Do you remember that? He would give them manna and he would give them quail, manna, quail, manna, more manna. Yeah, there's a great song that Keith Green used to talk, uh, sing, you know, about manna fish cakes and manna burgers. And they ate manna after manna after manna and they get fed up eating the manna. And then some of them started to complain and the complaining started to ripple through the camp. We wish we were back in Egypt. Remember what it was like? The onions, the garlic, the vegetables, the fruit. Oh, how we miss things back in Egypt. They looked back. You remember what happened to them? They died in the wilderness. They never got to the promised land. Yeah. I, want, I, I just want to say to you that God offers the promised land that's way beyond our wildest dreams. And it's based in following Jesus. He is our leader. He's our guide. He's the one that we follow. And we follow on. Yeah. I have decided to follow Jesus. We don't sing that song anymore. No turning back. No turning back. To be a follower of Jesus demands commitment. Yeah. There's something special when you see um, Christians who are just totally committed because they love Jesus so much. They just love him and they want to live for him and serve him with all of their hearts. Yeah. No turning back. Jesus didn't turn back. He resolutely went to Jerusalem. He's not asking us to do anything that he wasn't prepared to do himself. Yeah. So out of love for him, we're going to celebrate communion tonight. Because that's what communion is. It's, it's saying, Jesus, I love you. I remember you. I worship you. And you'll recall that when Jesus, in that final night before he went to the cross, he had a meal with his friends, 